when this law is passed in 2014, the bulk of us do our business 50 and under. And nobody's going to be required to buy health insurance for their employees at that point. Not the case. So why are they going to keep doing it? Because they want to. But are all small employers just so noble, so wonderful, just heartwarming people? <laughs> they do it because somewhere along the way, somebody has told them, wait a minute, this is good for your business. Mm -hmm. I'll put it in the simplest forms. There's five people in a break shop on one side of town and five on the other side of town. All the working conditions are absolutely equal, and as a result of it, both of those employers have two each of the best guys in town. And then I walk into town in 1977 or 76, and I convince one of those two guys to buy health insurance for their five employees. Do you know what the two best guys over on the shop without health insurance want? And, go and this guy has four, five people, two really good, three sort of good, and he'd just as soon get rid of the bottom two and take that guy's top two, and he'll be even Steven Swap. Now I got four good guys and one sort of good guy, and he's got nothing but bad. And who's going out of business by the end of the year? You see, we were so good with that argument through the 70s and 80s that the small group market exploded. And it became a situation where people just had to have health insurance. We had to sell the stuff before. Now they have to have it. And for, unfortunately, a lot of us got ver pretty lazy about it. We no longer work with the idea of why you're selling or why you're buying it. We work with spreadsheets. You're going to buy it, so it's just a question which is cheaper. And we spent all our time trying to find out which is cheaper, how to put in a better benefit, but lost the core reasoning behind it. This is going to cause you to rethink what's happening. I'll just give you an example. Let's say those, four, those five guys in the break shop. Some of them are really good and make good money. That's great. A couple of them, sort of not quite so good, so they're on the lower end of the wage. And they happen to have a wife and two children. And they're making maybe $25,000. Not uncommon for a repairman in a break shop. And so the owner of the business says to him, I don't need this health insurance anymore. Keith, you, your insurance company's been you know, just doing horrible things to me. I'm going to get rid of the whole problem. And besides, if I just dump the insurance for those five people, they'll go to the exchange because they have to have insurance. It's the law. And let's just say one of those guys is dutiful enough because he wants to take care of his family and his children, and he picks up the phone and he calls the exchange. And the exchange starts asking him questions about where he lives and his family and what he does for a living. And by the way, they're going to be asking all those questions. And all the information they collect is going to be reported to the IRS and the state agencies and all of the federal agencies that are involved in this. The people who run the exchanges are required to set up systems to do that. And you may say, well, that seems like overkill. You haven't got it yet. You see, once the system, once the guy in the exchange on the phone, the navigator, once he gets all that information, it goes through a little computer code. And out pops a decision. And the decision is, while this guy thinks he's lower middle class, having a nice life and doing all that thing, the government says he belongs on Medicaid. And the navigator then says, you have to go on Medicaid. You don't get a chance to buy the private policy in the exchange. They're make that yeah. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> but the guy says to wait, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. <coughs> Medicaid is that deal where like a fourth of the doctors in Orange, I'm, I'm sorry, 40% of the doctors in Orange County won't take it. Yeah, so what? But my doctor's in the 40% that won't take it. Well, then you just go buy a private policy on the private market. Oh, well, so, but since I'm low level, you'll give me some subsidiaries that I qualify for in the exchange? Oh, no. The only way you get the low income exchange support is if you stay in the exchange. And the exchange requires you because you're not above a certain federal poverty level considering your income and family, you must go that route. And now suddenly, the brake repair guy is going back into the employer and going, Man, I thought you were just ripping me a new one with these various changes in this private health care plan. Now you're pushing me into welfare. welfare. <laughs> what do you think his attitude is going to be as an employee? You can find new jobs. Yeah. So say, this is crazy. This is crazy. You say, well, it can't be that bad. Yeah, it's that bad. And I'll tell you why. Yeah. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove it to you. <laughs> See, everybody thinks 
if we all get health insurance we all get health care that just ain't the case one does not follow the other think of it this way you own a barber shop or a, or a stylist shop now in your stylist shop you're only getting one customer a week how long do you stay in business one week, one week. <laughs> now there is some number of customers you need every week to fill up the time in order to make enough money to survive I don't know whether that's 80% of your time or 70% of your time or whatever but let's just pretend you need to get 80% of your hours filled cutting hair doing styling work to survive now the government passes a law that gives everybody free haircuts and free styling so 3.6 million more Californians suddenly have the right to get a haircut or a hairstyling at your shop and the government's paying for it so they all rush right to your door but you only got 20 percent occupancy so are you going to throw me out your longtime customer who you know tips every time and frankly is working with a better paying plan or are you going to let all these 36 3.6 million into your shop and stand in line to give them haircuts at at state-based rates you may fill up your 20 percent but you're not going to go much beyond that and you're not going to kick out your old customers do you think doctors are sitting around with one patient a day there's some doctor out there with some capacity in his office flow but it ain't going to be for 3.6 million people and the small employer who just says I'm just going to throw everybody the wolves let them take their plan somewhere else that guy no longer has the private market plan which that doctor has kept the seat open for and that doctor is going to say no I'll take the first 20 percent that come in I'll fill up my capacity that's it and the rest of the people are just going to have to wait in line I'm sorry which means now you have insurance congratulations you don't have any health care you don't even have a doctor and if you think I'm kidding wait do you see the numbers from Massachusetts because you see Massachusetts did exactly that they gave coverage for everybody failing to understand there was only so much empty capacity in the system the numbers are horrifying when you realize how many people aren't getting care but they got health insurance the employer is going to have to face the fact that he's taking his office manager and putting her into a system that is probably not going to get her medical care even if it gets her medical insurance if that's what he wants to do to his beloved office manager well then maybe the beloved office manager shouldn't be so beloved better go look for another company that will give him private insurance because that's going to happen here here's the problem we all know this the costs have escalated we don't need to go through the details because we're short on time costs have gone crazy so something had to be done to cost deal with this cost curve the the, the amount of the, the government basically is saying the government programs like the Medicare and the healthy families and all that sort of stuff can do it so much cheaper and look at the comparison over the over the last 20 some odd years average rate increases of 6.8 on Medicare 7.1 on private health care us and says well that proves the government does it cheaper I know that's because Mr. Kaiser when he builds a new hospital he doesn't have to pay for it Mr. Kaiser doesn't have to go to the bank and get a loan and pay interest on the hospital he just built Mr. Kaiser just waves his magical wand and it all just happens simultaneously you know it doesn't Don Mr. Kaiser has to pay for that right but Mr. Medicare doesn't pay for any of its buildings Mr. Medicare's buildings come out of another portion of the government budgets so when Mr. Medicare says its rate only went up 6.8 it's failing to keep all the other things that the private carrier has to include in his cost of doing business and there's a huge amount of other things if we had the, the government assigned to Medicare all the same kinds of costs that a private carrier would do they would be at, a, at about a 10 percent rate increase we'd be way below them. but Mr. Medicare doesn't have to pay for its own building doesn't have to pay for the interest that's simply another part of the government we are the cheaper side and they know it we are Medicare Social Security is going to be the fastest rising cost in this new plan life expectancy alone life expectancy alone look at this 1980 to 2007 life expectancy raised four years 73.7 to 77.9 imagine amazing by the way 
What's that got to do with cost? <laughs> the longer we live, every year we live longer, that's the most expensive year. How about some other areas? Like here, sex and age. Uh, 11.9, this is on uh, uh, things like heart disease, very expensive diseases. 11.9 for young people, 37.8 for people over 75. And more and more and more, by the way, 1990 in the, in the 10 years, the amount of heart disease rose by, uh, what is that, about a third, <laughs> a third, a total of 33%. And of course, as we live longer and these diseases, we have to pay for them. So the cost of care is going to keep going up. The government's idea that it won't simply isn't true. How about this one? Cancer. Look at this. 4.0 if you're really young, if you're old, 19. Another down here, 22. Three points percentage difference in terms of growing rates of cancer. So we live longer, more cancers occur. The cost curve is inherently involved in two things. We're living longer and our technologies and medicines are getting better. As they get better, they cost more. So blaming it on the insurance industry doesn't solve the problem. They're going to have the same problem in the state exchanges and in the, the Medi-Cal's and the Medicaid's as we do. Same problem. Now here's one thing we do have a problem. Politically, the, the number of people insured by the private side is dropping, particularly amongst the younger, 18 to 44, dropping less there. Number of uninsured are rising. Any surprise there? We've been in the middle of a recession for what, three, four years. That creates the dynamic for a papaka to come along. It creates the dynamic for people to think they can get free health care if only they had free health insurance. But it's just not true. What else do we know? Papaka is designed to reduce the cost of health care. Got it? That's the goal. We all agree that's a good goal. And so what does it do? Well, first off, it increases Medicare payroll taxes. That's sort of contradictory to the goal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It puts in a Cadillac tax. That's not contradictory. How about new fees on medical device manufacturers and tanning booths? I love that. I don't know why they picked up tanning booths. Yeah, that's, yeah it must be to stop the cancer. I don't know. So let me see. You, their lobby isn't very big, yeah. yeah. You know what the real problem is? The tanning booth lobby? They're just lazy. They're always flat on their back. They're, 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 think about it. I put a new tax on a guy that builds the hip, the, 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 the piece of equipment, and somehow that's going to reduce the cost of health care? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the NR machine. Medi-Cal cost reductions. There's going to be $500 billion in Medicare savings. Now, how do you get $500 billion in Medicare savings? What's the typical way you do it? Anybody know? Cut benefits, or what's the more accurate way? Yep. Euthanasia, that's a word. <laughs> you cut what you pay the doctors. The fastest way is you say, the, effectively, think of a private organization like Mr. Blue Cross, who just says, I, I want to reduce my premiums. And so he releases a contract to all the doctors in California that says, I just cut all what we pay you 5%, and you have no choice, take it. All the Blue Cross doctors would quit. Well, guess what's happening in the Medicare system? Each time they cut back to save Medicare, how many doctors leave the Medicare system? How many doctors leave the Medi-Cal system? Medicaid system? And on and on. And that has a direct impact on what we're going to talk about the ability to get care. Obviously, they're intending to reduce Medicare Advantage payments. We already talked about that in the other class. And on top of that, they're planning to reduce the amount of payment they make to hospitals that cover the lowest and poorest number of our people. That's the savings they're talking about as though there'll be no reaction amongst the medical community. There's going to be a reaction. Now, they tell us they're going to fund new studies and new payment and delivery models. There is a great deal of hope about this, but here's what we know. The cuts and the costs we know are going to occur. The hope of savings is just that, a hope on speculation. We will be seeing whether that actually occurs. What they want to try to do is to align our system so that we are paying for outcomes rather than simply the number of times we see somebody. It's sort of like saying, once you get the guy's heart cured, we pay you, not how many times he comes in or how many surgery he gets. Payment for quality, not just quantity. That's the goal. ACO is going to, an ACO, by the way, you're going to have a new acronym, HMO, PPO, EPO. You get ACO now. And ACO is going to be a accountable care organization 
and it's going to be funded through the programs to pay doctors and hospitals for an outcome, a quality outcome, rather than the number of times they see people or the number of tests they get. Okay, got the picture? We'll talk more about this. There's going to be an independent board created that will make recommendations on how this gets paid and what the savings will be. The recommendations are going to go automatically to Congress, and Congress has to vote the recommendations out. It's an opt-out program for Congress. If Congress doesn't do anything, the rates will be set by this organization. But think about what I just said. One of the hardest things for the Congress to do is to, is to vote on pay cuts to doctors and hospitals. It's rife with political problems for them. So what do they do with the independent advisory board? Simply have them fiat the change, and Congress can then say, I didn't vote for that. They don't even have to touch it. It's a political expediency. But here's the problem for us. If this organization actually does start cutting more wages to doctors and hospitals, whether it's through a accountable care organization or anything else, what happens to the doctors who stay in the system? My bet is there's going to be less of them, and Massachusetts proved it. PACA requires all this stuff to be done on basically by comparing effectiveness of various kinds of research. Does this type of surgery work better on an angioplasty or does this one, whatever it may be. What they're looking to do is a good idea in one sense. They're looking to get a cookbook of the best possible, most effective cost procedures. But think about it, folks, because you lived through it. When the HMOs in California came in, and started trying to get this cookbook to tell doctors this is the most efficient way to do it. We're going to tell you how to do your practice to be most cost effective, et cetera. What did the public yell? Foul. Foul. The ACO is going to be our HMO of 20 years ago. And when I finish explaining it, you're going to say, yeah, that's exactly what it is. The rest of the country doesn't know what they're getting in for it. We at least know how to handle it. Yeah. What are some other sources? Obviously, this is a really cool idea. The idea is to get affordable care, make it cheaper, and so what we'll do with the machine is turn it against nonprofit hospitals and measure them so that if they fail, they can pay taxes. <laughs> what? You see, somebody got it in their head that there are hospitals that aren't really being nonprofit. They're not doing enough for the community. So the rules are going to be set. A community health assessment package will be put together. A nonprofit hospital will have to fill this out. And if they fail the test, they become a profit hospital and have to pay taxes. That's the goal. And that will reduce health care. No. Obviously, the thing is aimed to raise more taxes. Okay? It starts, by the way, 2012. So if you've got some little community nonprofit hospital, you're sitting on a board or something like that, you're going to have a whale of a time as this goes in. Obviously, it's going to raise costs, without question. What else have we got? Eligibility. I mentioned the fact that they're going to raise the federal poverty level to a, a third of the way above what's now known as the federal poverty level. For those who don't understand that, imagine you live in Kentucky. Uh, they do an analysis of the cost of living and all that sort of stuff for a single person. And they say, if you're making less than, say, $15,000 in Kentucky, you are at the poverty level. That's going to change from state to state, location to location. It's going to change on how many kids you got, whether you're married and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of the federal and state programs are based on if you're at the federal poverty level, you get certain things free or certain things with added benefits or subsidiaries or vouchers or whatever it may be. By raising that level, 33%, you now increase the number of people who can get the free coverage, the voucher, and the subsidiary coverage. That puts more strain on the system because now more money has to go out with money not coming in. They believe that this alone, the, now here, here's what the feds are going to do. They're going to pay back California until 2016 for the added cost of more people coming into the system because they raised the federal poverty. But come 2016, no more payments from the feds. And that's when you'll be asked to raise your taxes. And we're not going to do that. Now you may say, Don, you sound almost gleeful that it'll fail. No, I know it'll fail because poorly underwritten plans deserve to fail, whether that's the private market or the public market. The reason I'm sanguine about it is you're going to be in business. You're still going to be working with private market plans that are properly underwritten, funded properly, paid for by private dollars. And when this thing fails, we will still be there to pick up those pieces and get those insureds. Keep in mind, we've done this before. It was called the HIPAA. 
if you look at the California law, they practically just took the old HIPIC law, put it into the new law, changed the word HIPIC, and made it exchange. It had certain fallacies the last time around. It appears those fallacies are still there. Now, can a HIPIC or an exchange work in a private market properly run? Cal Choice, the Warden Brown California Choice. It survived all these years it beat it because it was done right. The machinery aimed at a good goal. It was simply designed incorrectly. 2017, we have to start picking up, and of course that means we have to shift budget items around. Not going to happen. I, I, just don't think, I just don't think we have it. Here's the impact to us though. By 2016, because of this federal poverty level and the bringing in of more people on a free or sub subsidized basis, we are anticipating $2 billion of higher cost to California by 2016. Okay? We are expecting $4 billion by 220, and when you look at the studies of that cost escalation, in about 2030, there'll be nothing left to pay for anything else in the state. It'll just be as simple as that. And of course, that's not going to happen. You know it, and I know it. Medicaid enrollment. It's projected to go up 59% or 3.6 million people. You say, why would that happen? Raise the federal poverty level. More people are eligible for the plan. Push them into the uh, exchange. More people get the navigator that says, surprise, you go that way. That's where they're going to end up. The majority of these will be newly eligible people because they're not eligible today. The jump, 2020 in spending attributed to federal government, that will be, uh, they'll constantly, constantly pay for a smaller share starting in 2016. Okay, here's the Rand Corporation. Rand Corporation concludes that by 2016 we'll have 96% of the people in California insured. And that's just 1% uh, off of what Massachusetts has. They have 97%. Very good study. Study does not include, however, the undocumented. You see, Papaka says if you're undocumented, you're not covered in this plan. Because, of course, there's a lot of fighting about that. Now, well, of course, nobody. I mean, in the state of California, if you're undocumented, you go to the hospital with, say, a real emergency of some kind, they just kick you out in the street. I mean, oh, they don't do that? You see what I'm saying when I say it's silly? The machinery was designed to do one thing, but in California, as in many other states, well, in fact, in all the states, because the federal law, if you have undocumented workers, they come to the hospital and have emergency type needs, they have to treat them. Now, where's that money coming from? Us. Some way or another, but it's not being accounted for in the PAPACA analysis. Yeah. I, I talked about those hospitals that are, are handling the undocumented, the poor, the people who are least likely to pay. Here's what PAPACA does to those. This is the reduction in millions going to those hospitals. By 2020, four billion in cuts to those hospitals. And yet somehow we believe that they're just going to keep operating. It's not going to happen. Yeah, the DHS money will run out. They are going to, there is going to be some additional payment if they get excess Medicare, Medicaid, but what they're getting paid extra is nowhere near it's what they're getting caught, cut from this program. And it'll be about two, five point five billion added in versus four hundred, whatever it may be. The reductions start in 2014 to those hospitals. What else we got? 30 million more people. We'll have 30 million more people in California competing for the same medical resources we have right now. 30 more people, million more people just walked in to get a haircut. And maybe you got a 20% occupancy. So you see what's got to happen. Okay? Workers' comp categorically will be affected. Curtis Incorporated, uh, June 2, th just uh, literally last month, costs are expected to rise 58% by 2018 on workers' comp programs due to medical claims, and se I'm sorry, 70% by 2018. Now, are we talking about the underlying cost of the care? No. We're talking about Don Goldman's employer kicks him out of his private plan. Don Goldman, maybe he's even given him more salary to try to have me go buy my product in the, in the exchange. But Don Goldman likes to drink beer and go to movies and things like that. So I use my money, my raise I was given to go buy health insurance myself, and I don't buy health insurance because I'm indestructible. But more important than that, I'm smart. You see, I'm out skiing or riding my motorcycle or doing whatever I do, and I bum up my knee. It hurts, but I don't have health insurance. No problem, because I'll be able to go down to the state exchange and get it tomorrow, and the pre-ex will be covered. 
but then I might go into those other plans I don't like and besides I don't have a doctor to go to anyway what's the one system that guarantees me the best care in the world I just skip into work very and the moment I cross that doorstep boom oh this is a terrible before we started selling health insurance to all the companies in America that's how all sorts of people got their medical care they show up at work workers comp claims came down as health insurance expanded there's no secret to this people are not stupid they're just not gonna you know that's the way it's gonna work and we know it we know it reduce the number of assureds provide quality care access to competent care monitor things all these things are great goals great goals right but here's the problem as the supply titans I'm sorry is, is the supply of patients <laughs> expand but the supply of doctors and hospital access reduces how are we going to handle it in the rural areas now everybody in Yuba City is covered where's the closest hospital in Yuba City we, we got counties up north where you'll have six counties of people all insured and one Sutter Hospital yeah how are you gonna do that build new hospitals I don't think so ethnic and cultural barriers we've got all sorts of people that are going to have a problem accessing any kind of care either for language or through concerns about where they come from or who they are and all sorts of things we got concerns about that uh, usually related to low income quite candidly what about this primary care 2010 if I don't have coverage even if I know I can buy the coverage tomorrow for pre-ex but I have no doctor where do I go to get my care the emergency room same place people go now 2010 this particular study the average wait time in a California emergency room was four hours and 34 minutes average wait time for a California emergency room but that ain't nothing check LA LA USC 15 hours is the average wait and now your small employer takes his cherished office manager takes away her private care gives her a raise and shoves her into the health care system through the exchange maybe she buys the coverage she's supposed to buy maybe she doesn't but at the time she gets hurt does she have a doctor does she have a hospital or does she end up here and what happens in terms of her psychology in terms of her employment ability that rubs off on the employer you see we're going to be teaching the employers these kinds of stories because these are real it's going to have a real impact on him in California when we push those millions of more people into the system without a doctor they're going to show up in the emergency rooms and right now because of the laws we have in California emergency rooms have been shut right and left in California we have 7.1 emergency rooms for every million people in the rest of the country we have 19.9 emergency rooms we have two-thirds less emergency rooms in California per million people than the rest of the country it will be overwhelming and your small employer wants to send his people into that they're gonna be very happy employees we need 206,000 more medical personnel right now that we don't have in California we don't have enough primary care providers we have specialty care providers but they're not allocated where are the best cardiologists in town Newport Beach Orange County uh, Beverly Hills Santa Monica try Fresno no <laughs> you don't become a cardiologist to go to Fresno <laughs> payment source in other words where the money comes from makes a huge difference to the doctor because the money doesn't come equally from different sources and we're going to take a look at that for example in California 92 percent of all doctors accept private insurance the other eight are you know cosmetic surgeons they live in Beverly Hills they work on cash whatever it may be nip and tuck okay only 78 percent accept Medicare only 68 percent accept Medi-Cal and if you want to narrow it down to Orange County that number probably drops to somewhere close to under 50 percent yeah it's bad so if you suddenly have a group of poor or low-income employees that are making up your workforce and they consider themselves up and coming model citizens giving you good work and you're just going to politely throw them off to the exchange and the exchange is going to politely tell them they got to go into that 
and suddenly the closest Medi-Cal doctor to him is Riverside. He's going to love your appointment. Yeah. Let's take a look at Massachusetts. Everything I've suggested so far is speculation for California, but it's based upon authority. 2006 required all citizens. In other words, everybody got insurance 2006 in Massachusetts. By 2010, only 3% were not covered. And those 3% had an interesting little technique. What they would do is they'd get sick, and then they would go and get coverage. They typically stayed inside the exchange, generating premium payments while they were in the exchange of $1,200 to $1,600 over a few months. But during that few months' time, they incurred $10,000 of expenses. Once they were treated, cared for, taken care of, they immediately did what? Drop their coverage. We all understand pooled risk means the healthy ones pay in to take care of the sick ones. The exchange in, in Massachusetts is upside down because as soon as somebody gets healthy, they get out. Why shouldn't they? Yeah. What happened then? Well, 68% of the people in Massachusetts continue to be covered by people like us, the private plans. Okay? Four types of public plans cover 27% of the people. Now that number only adds up to uh, uh, 95, and they supposedly have 97, but hey, it's the AMA study in Massachusetts, and it probably didn't link to the other study. What it's reflective, though, is this. These four plans are four types. I won't go into it real quick because we got a time problem, but the bottom line is the best paying plan is at the top, Medicare, the least paying plan is at the bottom. And what we're going to show you is what the doctors did when suddenly people were showing up with this plan or this plan or this plan because he makes the most of the, well he makes the most of the private plans they're not in this and the private plans in California uh, in uh, Massachusetts very similar audience uh, doctor participation is in California about 92 93 percent okay so who takes what primary care internists and family practitioners there it is 85 and 87 take Medicare if you go to the next level down on Massachusetts 53 just a little over half of the internists will take you as a patient if you go to the level below that, 43% will take you as a patient. And if you're at the poorest level, less than a third, about a third of the internists will accept you as a patient in Massachusetts. That's what I mean about you dump your people into those programs. You may give them health insurance, you ain't giving them health care. How about some other ones? Pediatricians, 89% accept mass health, 50% on the Commonwealth, 45% on the bottom one. Specialty care, cardiologists. 92 will take Medicare and it drops down to 76. OBGYN, at the lowest level, about three quarters of them, about a quarter of them won't take you. Orthopedic surgeries, this one's a real killer. 98% will accept Medicare and only less than, almost 60% of the orthopedics will not take the lowest level government plan in Massachusetts. Won't take the patient. That's huge. How about this? Well, I'll just get my, I'll wait to buy my insurance because they have to take me, it's pre-X, and then once I get it, I'll go to the doctor. That's how it works in Massachusetts, too. Primary care, the current wait is 48 days for a new patient to find a doctor. You've got people complaining to their employment employer about waiting three days for a referral. They haven't got a clue what it's going to look like. Family medicine, 36 days. Here's some interesting one. Pediatricians, 24 days. Specialty care. Gastroenterologists. 43 days to, to get into him, 36 last year. 36 days last year and one 12 month period later, seven additional days of wait. I can't even imagine what that's gonna be the next year. OBGYN, 34 last time, 41 this time. Orthopedic surgeons, 26 days, 17 days. By the way, very short wait, but remember the orthopedics were the ones that weren't gonna take anybody. That's why there's a short wait. Cardiology, this barely changed from year to year. And I was wondering about that, and I figured it out. No, 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 no. No matter if you don't, if you don't have a cardiologist, you die, right? Therefore, you know, the, the weight is zero. You die. It's great. What else are we gonna do? We're gonna chop the Medicare cuts in spending. These are the cuts in Medicare spending already booked into the Act. By 2014, Medicare Advantage will pay a doctor $1,267 less per year for each patient than they're paying now. How many doctors will stay in the plan then? I don't really know. $290 of cuts in the regular Medicare plan. 
There are numerous things in which doctors can make more money in Medicare, but for every dollar the system claims they can get in addition, they lose $10 somewhere else. I don't know how you run your business, but if I lose $9 on every swap on that deal, how do I do it? How do I stay in business? Volume. Right? Remember that old line? Yeah. The wellness benefits. We covered the fact that now you're in Medicare so you can get wellness. Remember that? What if every Medicare patient decided to go in for his wellness checkup? Everyone simultaneously took advantage of that just for fun. Here's what it would require. 23,000 additional doctors we don't have working full time, eight hours a day, nonstop, just to cover the one free benefit supposedly they now get. Getting a free health insurance benefit and getting the care is not the same thing. It's as simple as that. There are going to be bonus payments, payments for, for Medicare in shortage areas, uh, promotions of, to saving, cut costs, all sorts of stuff like that. But like I said, that equates about $1 addition, but losing $10 at the back end. Care programs. We're going to have various other kinds of programs which are designed to save things by trying to get people to be better at the hospital, be more efficient, less, uh, less uh, 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 reinfections, less deaths, that kind of thing. If it works, we should say, see some significant savings. But like I said, this is speculation. The cuts and the costs are real. Uh, by 2013, they're hoping to reduce 20% the readmission rates in terms of the hospitals. What else we got? Value-based purchasing. Again, that goes back to the issue we're going to try to implement quality, not quantity types of cares. And we're estimating $850 million savings there. But if you look at the cost in the other areas, that $850 million doesn't add up to much there are some accountable care organizations. We're going to call them quasi-accountable care because it actually didn't get off the ground exactly as planned yet. But there are some quasi ones out there we're going to talk about. It's designed to set up a group of hospitals and doctors so that payments are made to them based upon the outcome. The better the outcome, the more money they get. The worse the outcome, the less money they get. Got the picture? Okay. The ACOs must participate for three years. The ACO We'll start with the Part A, Part B assignments from Medicare, and they'll be given a group of people, and that group of people's medical histories will be documented and codified in the system and all that. So we'll have a baseline to determine whether the ACO helped these people get better or got worse, and payments will be adjusted based on that outcome. So you got, kind of got the picture. Bonus can be paid, and there's very targeted savings. Health and Human Resources will look at a population with this ACO and we'll say here's where we think that the, the uh, experience is going to be and if it meets this experience level you get a bonus we'll share it if, if it goes above that you don't get it whatever it may be all right kind of got the picture they're still working out the details how to do that but that's the theory all right okay now here's what you need to know particularly if you have Medicare patients whether they be Medicare patients as a part of the group Medicare primary or as an individual under the law, an ACO will assume responsibility for the care of a clearly defined population of Medicare beneficiaries, attribute it to it on the basis of patterns of their use of primary care. Now you say, what does that mean? Well, in common, common rhetoric, it means we're going to create a group of people. We're going to classify this group of Medicare people. We're going to measure them by their current usage. And then we're going to put them into this ACO under two different kinds of models. One of the models will allow the ACO to get more money if the outcomes are good. The other one will allow the ACO to actually take less up front and gain more on the back end. So if they think they can really improve the person's patients, they can double their bonuses. And creative incentive. Now you say, you keep talking about this group of Medicare people. Where are these people coming from? Accountable care organization is an organization that provides to agree to be accountable to the quality cost of overall medical care beneficiaries assigned to them. E Does that mean what I think it means? It means what it means. But here's the tricky part. The government said you wouldn't have to give up your doctor. But when I assign you to the ACO, you are giving up to your doctor, aren't you? But here's the problem. If these guys take on these Medicare patients, if they spend all the money to start to treat them and the patient doesn't hang around for a year or two years or three years to see if the outcome got better, how do they get their bonus? They won't. They won't. So we've got to make sure those patients stay in there. 
but the same time we've got a law that says you get to keep your doctor this is where the big swindle has to occur somewhere along the way Medicare is going to say to a whole group of your customers if you're Medicare that you are now assigned to these people it's probably going to use language that talks about how important it is you stay with them and it's going to encourage you to do everything but I doubt if it's going to have in big square letters what you're going to tell them which is you don't have to stay because it's not in the interest of anybody to force these people into the ACL and then openly tell them anytime you get tired walk away because they ain't going to make the system work so we're going to try to finesse this thing but that's not our problem our problem is our client if I've got a Medicare client inside of a small group if I got a Medicare client as an individual I'm going to make sure if they're not happy with that ACO that they understand they have a right to get out what really concerns me is think about the number of senior citizens and the way they think and sometimes they're in and they get a letter from the government that says this is your go there this is what you got to do I'm not sure that's fair the ACO is going to be signed a minimum of 5,000 enrollees. Of course, the ACO has, has to have a hospital specialist. And basically, a, the ACO has to operate like an HMO in California. It has to have all those contracts to cover all the things you need to be an HMO. It's called H ASC. The enrollees will be assigned. The assigned beneficiaries will provide, the, the ACO will provide the bulk of the care. Assignment will be invisible, supposedly. Uh, does not guarantee the benefit or choice of doctor. Uh, the beneficiary may seek other services the law says that question is will the person know it you'll tell them patient leakage is what concerns the ACO Craig made the comment that the ACOs have been pushed back a year because of this problem the people who are forming the ACOs have suddenly realized wait a minute if these people being forced into this system discover that they can leave who's left holding the bag the ACO is and so they're very much concerned about it. In fact, there's a test case going on in Northern California, right now in San Francisco area. Blue Shield of California is doing yeoman's work on this thing. It's a one-year agreement between this group of people. They're operating it like an ACO. We're calling it quasi because they're not officially recognized as, as an ACO yet. Uh, they're using 26,000 Medicare patients, which they got voluntarily. They got those voluntary patients by going out and doing what we do, which is encouraging them to come join, and as a result, they're guaranteed no raise in premiums on any of their Medicare supplement stuff. So they got a motivation to stay in the program. We'll see what happens as uh, Blue Shield works. I really wish them the best. I think they probably will do pretty good because they're working with them on a voluntary basis. Big difference, though. They have to supply all the equipment, the post-acute, all that sort of stuff. You now. Here's what has to happen inside that ACO, which is why it's going to be so expensive to get that startup. They have to do all sorts of robust and sophisticated clinical tracking. It's easy to track how many times a person takes a test. It's more difficult to track how much healthier they became as a result of the quality of outcome. So there's going to be new systems developed, lots of computer stuff. They're going to have to be reporting that back to Medicare. There's going to be a focus on all that quality control. Okay, we're going to go through this quick because we are out of time. There'll be measurement systems. If you want these charts, I'll be happy to give them to you. But the, the uh, ACO uh, regulators are setting up things that this identifies what's quality. You just have to follow the, uh, follow, the, follow the script, so to speak. There'll be patient satisfaction studies. How a patient likes being in the ACO will be measured. That'll be part of the payment as well. Why won't it work if it won't work? Well, here's the best analogy I can give you. 400 medical groups across the United States have written an article, sent it to the White House, to Congress, and everywhere else. These were groups that were in total support of the ACO. They were the leading groups in America that wanted the creation of ACO, people like the Mayo Clinic. What they wrote back was, while we represent one in three Americans on the healthcare thing, we represent the Mayo Clinic. The Cleveland Clinic was actually where Obama went to promote the ACO program when he was trying to sell the healthcare bill. That's how far they were behind this program. But the fact of the matter is, what they're concerned about is 90% of our membership will not participate because the rules as written are so onerous, it would be nearly impossible for them to succeed. They went on to write, regulations are overly prescriptive, operational burdensome, and the incentives are too difficult to achieve to make this a voluntary program. In other words, to work, it's got to be forced on people. One problem, 
these groups haven't got the experience that we in California have. We've been managing capitated systems in California through our medical groups and hospitals for 30 years. These groups in the other parts of the world, other parts of the country, they have not been doing that. An HMO, for example, in Florida, looks more like a PPO to us. It's not like those old capitated HMOs that we have. Yeah. So they're not really sure they can manage that risk. What they're, t they're totally concerned about their exposure to the loss. And it's a real problem for them. Private insurers, we may get involved with the, and as Blue Shield has done, because there may be some good come out of that. Think about it. If a carrier could actually come up with a prescriptive workbook that helps us be more efficient in what we're care, we can lower the private market costs. So that would be very important. I'm going to go off script for a couple minutes because I want to get you all out of here on time. Because I want to talk about the most important parts of this. What do we do with it? It goes back to the same thing. We've got to use this knowledge to start prepping those clients for 2014. You may think 2014 is a long time away. There, think about it. Sometime in 2013, some employer is going to start making a decision as to whether he's going to ship his people to the exchanges or whether he's going to keep them employed. We need to start talking the talk about the quality of, of patient care that's going to be represented by the private market versus any public-based program. We need to start talking about the real-world experience of, of what people are going to do, what employees are going to do when you simply kick them out and have them go buy their own insurance. We're going to have to start learning, which we're going to learn in number six, how much on average productivity falls when you do that to an employee. How much a thing called presentism, where the person just shows up, but they got a chronic problem, whether it be an allergy or high blood pressure, but they're not taking care of that thing, so they sit there at their desk, well enough to show up, but not well enough to be productive the way the guy needs them to be productive. We're going to study the costs of that workers' comp when people start shifting where they get their care. We want you to be prepared and start talking today to those rotten employers, so mean and nasty that they freely buy their health insurance today. And we think they're just going to ditch us all out. They're going to ditch us in the street if we don't make it clear to them. If we, if we let them think the only cost is $2,000 per person, if we think that's the only cost, man, as a small employer, I'd do it. But that's not going to be the cost. We need to start talking. We'll, and we'll hammer down to the actual numbers in our sixth class. But I want to go one further. And I want to talk about that employer who right now doesn't care about his people, truly doesn't. Is he your customer? No. He's running the sweatshop or the minimum wage pay people or whatever it may be. He's not buying health insurance from you now. And he's not going to buy from you in the future. The one advantage we have on him is we're going to hit him for $2,000 a person or $3,000 a person. And at the very least, you see, his people are coming back into our private side system through the emergency room or hospitals that we're paying for out of increased premiums. So at the very least, we're going to get money out of him back into the system we're currently not getting. That's a good thing. We just need to be able to do that two-step to make sure the person understands getting health insurance and getting health care are not the same thing. The guarantee of health care comes with your private coverage, as it did in Massachusetts. The guarantee of health insurance being paid through various plans that won't pay as much, that doesn't guarantee the health care. Giving a guy a bunch of money and telling him to go buy his own insurance is a good way for him to get a higher car payment, move to a better rental unit, but he ain't going to be buying health insurance and the employer is going to pay for that raise two or three times over and lost productivity and with the choices the guy makes.